Hello everybody, this is Filiberto Amati. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Chris Maffeo. Chris Maffeo is a, another Italian like me, a long-term friend, uh, and is a former Carlsberg, former Sam Miller Asai, uh, and someone who's been collaborating with the Martin Associates on a number of projects. And for me, Chris is really an expert uh, of what's happening uh, on the on-premise, on the Oreca channel which is why I'm here today to talk with Chris about, you know, what he thinks is the future of the Eureka, both in the short and the longer term. Uh, at this stage, given the Corona crisis and the coronavirus and COVID-19 crisis, uh, it's very difficult for us to build a comprehensive future scenario because the number of uh, known unknowns uh, it's far greater uh, than the vectors we actually really are able to predict. First of all, we do know a little bit about the virus, but we really don't know everything. We don't know about future waves. We don't know about uh, whether herd immunity is true or not. Uh, experts are still debating. Uh, there is way more we need to know about that. We need to learn. In addition to that, there are, of course, uh, uh, a number of uh, scenarios as many countries are moving to phase two, and they're doing that uh, uh, through different schedules with different approaches. Uh, it's also a learning phase. We know there is a lot of fear from a consumer point of view and from a worker point of view. People are, are scared. Uh, which is why uh, the re behavioral economists tell us that, you know, we're all uh, binge buying uh, toilet paper, for example. Uh, and this is going to create uh, um, country by country, culture by culture, uh, a wave of uncertainty, of further uncertainty, before we arrive to normality. And by the way, we don't know what this normality is going to be. In addition to that, uh, we have uh, also a number of unpredictable outcomes which are linked to social and political uh, affairs. Uh, we know Brexit uh, happened, between quote and quote, but we don't know what's happening at the end of uh, uh, the transition period, at the end of this year. Uh, there was supposed to be a negotiation, which is actually uh, very slow uh, at this stage, uh, and that could be a shock for both the UK and the European Union. There is political elections in the US uh, and that could create another shock wave uh, throughout the world. So it's really difficult for us uh, in terms of a uh, foresight to predict uh, uh, what's going on. So this is why uh, I'm here with Chris today to be able to uh, uh, let's say, uh, chat a bit, I have a few questions for him. Uh, and so uh, let's go to them. First of all, Chris, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome. Cool. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. So first of all, what do you see in the short term, uh, the role that uh, food brands and beverage brands can play in helping the on-premise Eureka channel, which is one of the channels which is struggling the most, and it's gonna struggle the most as we move forward in the phase two and phase three. Yes, Filberto, thanks. Uh, that's, uh, that's a very interesting question because I think that's, uh, that's I mean, we, we, are, we are already seeing it. Uh, we're already seeing all around the world in the biggest cities and in, in the smaller ones. Uh, on-premise places uh, and venues uh, struggling. Um, I think the interesting point is that many, many um, companies have already taken action, like all the spirits brands, like Bacardi, Diageo, but as well the beer brands, uh, like Asahi, Heineken, Carlsberg, and so on. Like they are trying to support uh, the, um, the the outlets. Um, I've seen, for example, um, you know, many of them donated to the industry. Uh, it would be interesting to know, like you know, how they managed to really reach the end, uh, the end uh, venue, uh, because they I've seen that they donated millions of dollars uh, each each company. But uh, we need to understand really like where this money went and if they really got it, because I think that's the crucial point that 
you know, even governments announced uh, help and support to to the industry. But at the same time, you know, when I talk to you know ex customers and friends owning bars and restaurants, I see that they are struggling. Like some of them, they didn't get the money. Some of them, they didn't get the, you know the money to to support the the unemployment and the furlough. Uh, of their of their employees and their, and their staff, um, so I think that in in this one, I think in on this question, like the devil, the devil is in the desert for real. Uh, it's really understanding, you know, what actually went into the, you know, pockets of the of the venues. Uh, for sure, like there's many things that are also like intangible, like going out from the, uh, you know, monetary uh, help that can be provided. For sure, one of the things is really like you know mental support like we we have seen you know the the struggle of these owners you know going from uh, uh you know having a running out and the employees as people. well not only the and owners <laughs> exactly and uh the the, the places and um, it's really uh it's really interesting like you know like the companies can for sure like be more present you know i've seen many you know uh, emails that you know sometimes like sound a little bit aseptic and uh, you know cold on uh, you know we are close to you in this moment but you know they're, they're, the the normal reaction would be okay but what are you uh, actually doing for me to, uh, for for real so even a phone call sometimes you know can make a difference on understanding okay don't worry about you know the the payments uh, you know like we can we can extend payment terms or if the venue is is, is actually open doing takeaways and deliveries you know it could be uh, you know, free goods uh, delivered to them for for takeaway orders and uh, and you know this kind of like support that can be seen as actual money or you know avoiding paying uh, you know debts in the short term. So I think these are the 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 most important one that I can think of. One important one is also the. Um, uh, you know, investment on on uh, trainings uh, for the bar staff. You know, I think that's still, you know, a very valid point on many of these companies. Like I've seen, you know, for example, Diageo with their uh, program with bartenders uh, all around the world is still happening. You know, more online than uh, than in the real uh, uh, venues, and so are doing all the other you know spirits brands and so forth. Uh, let's let's keep for a second on the, on the intangibles and and, and and this dimension of training because we know okay uh, so far that there is going to be a new normal yes. we don't know whether this is a transitory interim normal or it's just brand new reality uh, in this context of a new normal new skills new competences are needed so uh, Absolutely. Is there a pro, even though we don't know what's the final scenario, is there a process of learning and unlearning? Because learning begins with forgetting what you know yeah. to begin with, where uh, brands can play a role. I don't know, do you have any examples uh, or do, any expectations um, or any recommendations? I think like for sure, like, the, you know, the big trend is really like, uh, you know, that is coming out of this is the digital, digital enablement, you know, like uh, I think in, you know, take it in the, you know, very uh, holistic aspect of mm -hmm. digital enablement, you know, like it goes from having a website that can accommodate orders or, you know, showing an offer or a menu to actually, you know, enabling, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, taking order and so on, but also like trainings, for example, like I know that many companies, like when I was in Casberg, we were doing uh, something about uh, enabling, uh, you know, bar staff. So it was like an, an application that you could, that you could, you know, that the owner or the, the manager could give to his staff on really learning about, for example, in that case, beer. So mm -hmm. what is a beer? What is a lager? Bottom fermentation, top fermentation, you know, so that they could actually do it on their mobile you know, really learning as a, almost as a Duolingo of beer, let's call it. Um, you know, so th there's many things that we can think of that are crucially important in these times, especially, I mean, I was listening to a podcast uh, uh, recently 
about uh, you know uh, there was a the, um, you know a sommelier that was that was explaining you know how it is to live in this in this time of uh, furlough you know all around the world from Hong Kong to New York, and and it's crucially important to understand that you know now that people and especially bar staff has free time like, let's call it free time you know uh, being unemployed or on furlough uh, you know maybe they've, they've dreamt of having some time to actually study about wines or about spirits or about uh, fermentation or about distilling and so on. And now this is the time. So, so the mistake that people could do is, uh, you know, sit on their couch and, you know, watch Netflix instead of, uh, you know, like actually investing their, their time. We on, like uh, Netflix, on, on but learning. learning is good. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, and actually the, there's a, there's actually like a few movies that are really interesting even to learn more about in, uh, you know, Netflix or even uh, masterclass, you know, I saw that, uh, you know, for example, Mr. Lion from Lioness in London, like they've just released their, uh, you know, mixology training, That's cool. uh, which is, uh, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, speaking about mixology, we, uh, uh, I've heard uh, that, you know, in Milan, for example, a few cocktail bars were quick to readapt uh, and started doing delivery of cocktails. Uh, this is, of course, you know, uh, it sounds far-fetched, but we know that, uh, uh, and actually you told me in, in, in one of the last projects we worked together, that already in places like New York and London, uh, the cocktail culture is changing to the extent that uh, a few cocktails are pre-prepared, either batch or uh, they're served on draft, for example. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, with that trend, doing the delivery at home, it's actually almost a normal consequence. So, uh, what are the ways that cocktail bars can pivot besides that? And what brands and manufacturers, producers, wholesalers can do to help that uh, that trend yes i mean this is a really really interesting point because uh, i mean we see let's say like my my way of analyzing the uh, the covid 19 crisis is that i mean being a disruption uh, you know i wrote an article recently about it uh, you know being a disruption like what happens usually during disruptions is that you know some of the trends that were already happening and were on on the way up you know they fast track themselves, mm -hmm. you know, like they accelerate all of a sudden and they become, you know, adoption, like you see <laughs> Zoom, as, Zoom. As, we are, <laughs> as we are talking now is a, is a great example of that. Um, but also, you know, and, and some of them that might have been on the way up, then, you know, they crash down and they will never happen uh, anymore. On, 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 the, on the positive aspect of it, on those that, are, that can fast track, I think is really this, uh, this um, mixology in, uh, in pre-batched and uh, uh, you know, in a new way to enjoy cocktails. I remember really like maybe like five, six years ago, I was in Helsinki and, um, and also here in Prague, you know, I, I order a cocktail. I, I think I, I order a Negroni. And it's one of my favorite, as you know. Uh, we can tell but... from your background. Uh... <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and um, you know, and you can you can see that uh, you know, like so, sorry, I, I I got it as a uh, you know as a, as a bottle, you know, as a bottle with a, you know with a glass with ice, you know, with a nice uh, piece of ice, and you know, and I got it. You know, the the, the guy didn't do it in front of me. You know, he just gave me a bottle, and 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 I could do it myself and uh, it was already pre-done and it was you know aged in a wooden barrel i think it was like a bourbon barrel if i remember right and and i was kind of like shocked in the beginning uh same thing happened to me when i was in new york last last year you know i ordered an Negroni. i was in dante dante new york city you know number one in the 50 world's best uh, list mm -hmm. and uh, for, I ordered a Negroni now. <laughs> for a few years yeah and I ordered a Negroni and I got it as a, as a draft. You know, it was a draft Negroni. So there's, uh, there's a lot of things that to the, you know, average consumer, you know, of, of course, like we're talking about places that are, you know, a certain type of places, you know, like they're not the average, you know, cocktail bar. You know, they are the guys that actually 
you know, really forward thinking. Uh, and of course, although they couldn't predict the COVID, you know, they could predict, you know, where, you know, it could go in, you know, deliveries and doing mm -hmm. takeaway uh, cocktails. So I know that there are some spirits brands, for example, that are already supporting, or at least they are looking into supporting, uh, for example, draft, uh, draft cocktails. Uh, not only the normal ones, you know, like, you know, Negronis and, uh, mm -hmm. and the Manhattans, but also, you know, other, you know, more innovative one. Or if you think, think of a gin and tonic, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's carbonation in it. So it, it needs a little bit more, uh, you know, effort to, to, to be done. Uh, so that on, on, the, on the company side, but also on the, on the bar side, um, you know, like there's a lot of them, you know, I, I can think of, uh, you know, three sheets in London, uh, selling, selling cocktails, you know, in small bottles, you know, like already, you know, you can buy six Negroni yeah. for a certain amount of pounds or, you know, the same Dante, you know, they, they do their martinis or their Negronis, you know, take away, you know, they do it take away if you go to the door because, you know, in, in New York, uh, you know, uh, they, they can yeah. they can sell alcohol outside. Uh, you know, there, there was a, uh, you know it, it was part of the measures like the you know to to, to support the on trade outlets. Uh, so they they actually it, it was funny. I, I saw on Instagram that they uh, they re recycled their um, coffee cups. You know, like the one to do latte uh, takeaway, and they actually using it for Negronis or spritz and. And, uh, and so forth. So that's, that's a pretty uh, interesting one. Uh, but also like the, then there are, there are some smaller startups. I can think of, for example, like you mentioned Milan, you know, Neo Cocktails in, mm -hmm. in Milan. They, um, they are quite innovative already like between two and three years ago, they started to, uh, to prepare this, uh, you know, uh, squared uh, boxed yep. cocktails, of course, on the, on the most, uh, most let's say uh, famous uh, cocktails and they they sell that they're quite easy to transport you know they go into a box you know it's, it's almost like a it's cd a, it's an almost an envelope CD. basically it's a yeah it looks like an envelope, envelope. it looks like a cd yes a cd well. cd box so you can slice it uh, mm -hmm. you know in, uh, and, and stock it quite easily uh, so there's a lot of um, ferment uh, pardon the, the game of uh, words on, uh, on this La fermentation is, uh, is one of the big trends for sure uh, I've, I've even seen it in the vacuum I've seen some some uh, some cocktail bars that I'm selling like you know vacuumed uh, cocktails so it looks like uh, you know it's a soft uh, kind of like an ice uh, uh, pouch, ice, ice pouch yeah and, uh, and inside there is a you know a Negroni or a Martini cocktail and, uh, and so forth so in that sense you could say that uh, uh, because uh, uh, traditionally the, the bartenders the mixologists their core competence was actually mix to drink and serve it and there is experience and of course there is all the flair which of course exactly. at this point it's, it's gone but then Brand owners and manufacturers and brands in general were actually uh, the expert on the logistical side. So, exactly. uh, uh, you know, how to better uh, pour something into a bottle <laughs> for transport or, exactly. or introducing pouches, uh, new, new delivery mechanism or even having... For sure, for sure. So um, in that sense, we could say that brands... Uh, should probably try to figure out a way to bring the knowledge and in the form of an innovation to the bartenders so that they can actually uh, find better ways in coping uh, with this pivot uh, from on-premise on to delivery and takeaway. Absolutely, and and also I would I would also add to to your point the um, you know the the importance of you know making sure that they are part of the game you know because at yeah. the same time you know the, in the moment of the pre the the, the, the pre batching or the mixing of course like brands lose control of you know what's in the drink because you know even uh, as a consumer I don't even see you know what what which bitter they use which vermouth they use and and, and so forth. Uh, 
Uh, of course, the innovation are often, you know, coming from the smaller players, from the craft, uh, from the you know craft guys. Um, but it's it's crucially important for them to really be part of the game, also, you know, in the marketing of the cocktail as such, you know, because uh, if you think about it, I mean, it's still at the very let's say embryonic stage this because you know when you go on the on the website of these famous cocktail bars you know you can still pay you know quite a lot of money for uh, you know six bottles of negroni shipped to your door obviously and and you you know the average consumer might be you know uh, influenced by that one but then they might still want to do it themselves at home because they you know, uh, they they might not be able to afford it, or uh, you know, like it's still not reached. Uh, you know, so I'd rather buy three bottles of you know, bottle of gin, bottle of bitter, bottle of vermouth, uh, rather than buying you know six small bottles and then uh, you know pay probably even the same amount of money. Uh, but it's not made it. by Dante. So <laughs> it's not made by Dante. That's the that's the thing. So it's uh, I think that's where the brands can play a role. You know, to really liaise yeah. with uh, you know with the with the trendsetters in the trade, but also you know to make sure that they don't alienate the average consumer that that is actually repeating the mm -hmm. the purchase. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, innovation on the on-premise for when they open, okay, beyond the current pivot, uh, you know, everybody's talking about the touchless economy or low-touch economy. Mm -hmm. Do you think we will see the emergence of uh, more robots in preparing uh, and uh, our food, our drinks, and delivering our food and our drinks? You know, beyond of what, what's happening in Japan or China, for example? Yeah. Or what kind of I automation think, yeah. do you see it's gonna? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you ask me, yeah, uh, I mean, if you ask me like this, like you know, robot as you know, as such, uh, I would say no, not really. I don't see it happening. You know, like it can be, you know, like some, let's say, test drives, and uh, you know, it's like the automatic, uh, you know, automated driving and so on. It's still like a thing of the future, in my opinion. If you ask mm -hmm. me. What if if you ask me like you know com, com, let's say connected to what I was saying before about the digitalization and the digital enablement, I think that that's for sure going to be uh, speed up. You know if you if you think of you know like the economic uh, you know and financial problems that all the outlets are you know bars and restaurants are getting now, uh, I think what's uh, what's crucial is to really take control of the bottom line and and of course you do that by you know managing your stock you know is one of the, mm -hmm. the the main things and also of course you know managing the revenues and the revenue and and profitable uh, management um, of, of the places so there are solutions that are uh, enabling that you know like it, it goes you know there are if, if you think about the, the, the current situation, there are, you know, the, the pen and paper guys, you know, like the one that are still taking the order, you know, pen and paper and, you know, they, they shout it at the kitchen and then the kitchen does it. And, and, and on that one, it's all about the people and there's no, let's say, digital control of the stock management and so forth. Then there's the super high tech you know, solutions on, uh, you know, billing and cashiers and uh, mm -hmm. reservation and table allocation and so forth. And then there's a whole world in between, you know, I can think, for example, here, like company that is really growing nicely, it's Astorius uh, here in Prague, you know, they have like quite a lot of nice, uh, nice outlets also up or, um, in, uh, in their clientele. And they are, they're, they're trying to actually catch the, the middle ground, you know, on, you know, I cannot afford to buy you know one of these information solutions that are crazy expensive you know think of all the bistros and cafeterias that are growing this uh, in these days but how can i control that you know uh, my stock of whatever salmon or eggs or avocados or uh, you know bread can uh, you know can be controlled and uh, and i don't i don't incur into you know overstocking and mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so forth uh, so I think that one will be more and more present because uh, people will want to see more of that. And I think on that one also, the, you know, brands can play a role uh, because, you know, for them to really have 
information about the last mile, uh, it's crucial, you know, because now when they go through wholesalers, of course, they, they miss that, you know, last mile, of course. Uh, you know, apart from outlets where they, you ship directly, then of course you have all the information on sell in and sell out. But if you think of places that they go on, uh, uh, you know, wholesalers or distributors, then you cannot really take control and it would be interesting to understand okay, how can you do it? And, uh, you know, how much is a beer in the vicinity of this area? Mm -hmm. Or how much is a cocktail in the vicinity of this area? Of course, taking care of the GDPR and all the important privacy information, but you can still, you know, aggregate the data like, you know, like Google does with Google Maps, for example, and, uh, and get really interesting insights out of it, I would say. Yeah, on this topic of uh, innovating because uh, and data, uh, there is a lot of things which don't exist uh, yet. And I remember that my the, the first company I worked with uh, was Procter and Gamble back at the end uh, of the nineties, and uh, um, they were really interested in uh, breaking the monopoly uh, back then of the online market research. And uh, since they didn't see any further players coming up at that point, they actually created their own company, okay? Oh, wow. uh, they, and they spun it off and then they sold it because they wanted to push the envelope and they wanted to make sure there was more competition for better quality, for better pricing, uh, and they wanted to grow the market. Do you think that uh, uh, producers should actually either uh, alone or in consortium try to uh, bridge this gap this data and technology gap that we see or uh, or is uh, this wishful thinking uh, i don't know i mean like i i think like you know i think i know that so you know many many of the companies that i'm working with and that i'm you know that i've been in touch with in the last in the, you know, the in the last months, you know, they're all going through a digital transformation, you know, so uh, that is surely part of the agenda. The thing is that the digital transformation agenda is so broad that, you know, if this is part of it, you know, it's one of the elements and for sure, you know, there's a lot of companies and startups that are already, you know, at, uh, you know, higher level in, in know-how and, uh, you know, problems and you know fixing problems and learning from from their mistakes uh, so one way could be you know to do the the same way that for example beer companies have, have been doing for, with with, beer, with craft beer brands you know, like it's rather you know through acquisition than uh, than by creating their own startup and then mm -hmm. selling it it's more like by letting somebody else creating it and and buying it uh, rather uh, but it's an interesting point. I didn't think about it. Uh, for sure, the information is, is is crucial and is key. You know, both the big data, but also the small data. You know, because let's not forget the, you know, qualitative uh, type of research, which is you know what we what we do uh, when we when we do some projects together as well. Uh, and it's uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a crucial aspect that you know companies should never forget. I don't know if they will manage to internalize it or if they are, you know, if they will let, you know, more consultants like us to, to do it for them because they are busy, you know, on their, uh, you know, everyday agenda rather. Uh, I understand, but on the other end, and that's where the, I think the challenge is, uh, some of these data are gonna make or break with the volatility and uncertainty a lot of players in the on-premise. Sure, sure. well, by point. the way, you know, you can give them data, okay? You can give them free and cheap data, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, bar owners are very good uh, at running a bar. They are clueless about running inventories. You know, it, it's not only about which, by the way, producers and manufacturers uh, are probably much better off. They have a much better understanding, but they have no data. Absolutely. Uh, so probably, uh, I think it's also part of the uh, uh, new context, which is coming from this uh, increased vol volatility and increased uncertainty, where probably players can, uh, uh, brands can play a role 
which is useful for themselves, but it's also uh, avoiding extinction, mass extinction in the on-premise, which by the way, they're going to pay the cost of as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, for sure, for sure. I mean, like, they're, they're never going to recoup enough trade what they, you know, what they're losing in on-trade uh, margin-wise as well. So, of course, it's uh, it's crucially important. I didn't I didn't think about it that way, to be honest. It's uh, it's a good point what you are what you're saying. Uh, for sure, there could be even like a consortium of you know industry uh, leaders uh, that you know if you think like you know I don't know beer companies uniting or spirits companies uniting on uh, on trying to really rescue the on trade because I think we are as you 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 said it right in the beginning. You know we don't know. Well, we don't know what we don't know, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, you know, like there's a lot of articles, there's a lot of, you know, speculations you or know, ideas. Sir, we know we don't know. <laughs> oh, and we don't, and we know, we, yeah, we know, we know that we don't know exactly. And, uh, and I think it's important for, uh, you know, the, the more, you know, weeks will pass by, the, I have the feeling that the worse it gets for, uh, Mm -hmm. for the you know for the for the horror guy for the on trade so the moment that companies will realize that it's it's a big problem and probably they cannot fix in themselves uh to rescue their customers then uh, uh probably like you know some actions like what you are uh suggesting i, I think they're they're probably gonna happen perfect so i have uh, three final questions for you uh -huh, okay. uh, uh, number one, do you think that uh, uh, on premises uh, uh, and especially on the restaurant side should actually look into becoming ghost and dark kitchens, developing this uh, on premise uh, uh, delivery channel exclusively? Uh, Pros and cons. That's, yeah, I mean it's um, it's an interesting you know, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, like there's uh, you know for for sure ghost kitchens will appear more and more in uh, uh, in the cities. You know, we will see them more and more. Uh, I think the moments uh, you know it's. I mean, assume, like, assuming you are not Dante, but you are in Manhattan with yes. the lower traffic and Manhattan rent, shouldn't you? just shut down your premises and, th and take maybe a cheaper delivery uh, rental space sorry, uh, uh, in Brooklyn where you can mm. actually run a good kitchen from for, for a foreseeable period of two to three years. Wouldn't you do that or wouldn't you recommend it, it that? Could, yes, it could, it could be an option. It could be an option. I mean, like it's uh, for sure, uh, you know, what I, what I see is that, you know, like there will be more and more, you know, opportunities will happen because, you know, a lot of places will close, you know, there's some statistics say, mm -hmm. you know, 30% uh, of the on trade uh, will close. Uh, and there will be a lot of opportunities in terms of spaces, but at the same time, you know, like the, let's say the window in the wall mm -hmm. type of uh, location, I think will, will be, you know, one of the aspects of the future, you know, like smaller concept, few tables outside because it might not be needed, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, in one of the scenarios, you know, if you have a, you know, a 10 seats, you know, 10, you know, 10 tables or five tables venue, you know, you don't know how you're going to, to cope with the, you know, social distancing inside. Uh, so it will be focusing on actually doing more and more takeaway and, uh, you know, the, you know, delivery. So to your point, you know, if you skip the, the actual takeaway aspect, uh, then it becomes like a ghost kitchen type of proposition, you know, because it becomes like, okay, I'm actually just delivering. Uh, and of course it, you know, the way I see it and the way I studied it, you know, it's quite hard for places not to work with the, uh, you know, uh, aggregators, you know, like Uber Eats or Bolt or, you know, mm -hmm. Deliveroo and so on, because, you know, their algorithms are, you know, top notch, you know, like they, they are the ones that can optimize the routing, uh, you know, between venues, clients and pickup and delivery and so on. Um, so, of course, you know, if you want to give margins to these guys, 
you know you need to cut costs on your side you know there's no other there's no other way to to make it feasible so so that surely will be a possibility because to do your own deliveries by yourself that's that's never going to happen you're not you know, going to have the reach um, you're not going to have the you, you can you can uh, do it but then after a few months we realize how much you've spent and and how much you didn't sell and one important aspect i was talking to a friend of mine owning a restaurant here in, in prague and he's saying you know when he sees the stats coming from food aggregators um you know like delivery you know delivery companies uh you know 50% of his uh, orders for example last week were new customers that he has never seen and and he is a neighborhood you know uh, restaurant you know so the ability you know to actually reach and grow penetration that's an interesting point because what you said you know like you are you know you have manhattan to your door exactly. or you have prague or you have warsaw you have milan you have rome you know all of a sudden you know you were used to run a different game you know you were a neighborhood place and uh, and and now all of a sudden you know like it's uh, it's it's changing totally which is actually leading to another point maybe would be one of your questions i don't know uh, you know what happens to these key opinion leading outlets you know because they were you know basing everything i mean not everything of course that they, they're offer but you know part of it was you know the ambience and i go there to to look cool to see cool people to enjoy a nice atmosphere away from home you know do i want to have that kind of experience back home uh you know in my kitchen uh and and that opens you know a totally longer conversation that we can take another time i think as exactly. i think that's a, uh that's a, a great topic for a follow up interview <laughs> but not this time. <laughs> no, absolutely. So, uh then uh, the last two elements. Uh we have seen uh and, and this is two questions in one, but two big trends in beverages. First of all, the uh, blurification of categories, you know, uh, with the uh, um, spirits playing soft drinks, soft drinks playing spirits. Uh, uh, hard cells are emerging, uh, and of course, NOLO uh, as a new category, uh, as a spirit almost, uh, without spirit, without alcohol, or with low alcohol. So, do you think that uh, uh, these uh, trends will be accelerated? or not because of the crisis uh, do you expect categories to you know die or getting extinct because of the crisis and what can craft producers craft kombucha producers or emerging nolo brands uh, do to survive or tap their opportunities in the crisis Wow, that was a difficult uh, question. I will try to remember uh, all the points. I'll try to answer like just uh, remind me things if I if I if I don't answer you. I think you know to to the blurification of the uh, of the categories. I think that will continue. I think uh, if you know, I don't want to go too far because we already don't know what's going to happen in in a month. But you know, if you take like in let's say years from now i think categories as we know them uh will probably disappear mm -hmm. you know like beer spirit csd uh, and so forth i think it will they will disappear you know like i i just read an article yesterday on new york times where you know to avoid um uh, you know microbreweries throw away their their kegs because they are getting out of date you know some distillers are actually distilling the beer uh to make whiskey uh oh, out wow. of it which is like you know if if you if you think about it, it makes sense i mean i'm not a distiller and i'm not uh, you know i've been working in beer for many years but i'm not a brewer for sure uh but it's it's you know it, it was amazing to read it because you know it's it's about blurification it's about circular economy you know it's about you know waste management is about many things 
uh, at once. You know, it's a green economy and so forth. So that that leads to the other point, which is um, you know, no low and mm -hmm. you know, hard seltzers and so on. So if you think about you know, hard seltzer and nolo, which, you know, sounds the opposite in one way, because in one way you are, you know, not having alcohol in a, in a distilled product. And in the other one, you are mm -hmm. having alcohol in a, you know, in a seltzer or in a, in a soda water. Uh, but it, it actually goes hand in hand in a way, because the trend is actually heavy. Uh, you know, because on hard seltzer, you want to, cut on the calories but you still want to have the alcohol so it's let's say two sides of the same coin the way i mm -hmm. I, I, I see uh, so on one end you know i want to have less calories and still you know enjoy the the, the alcohol effects uh, in, in on the other hand i don't want to have alcohol but i still want to enjoy the you know the ritual and what it gives me and i don't want to look strange when all my friends are are drinking and I'm the designated driver, or if I, you know, if I'm joining a group of friends and I'm my car and I cannot drink, so you know, I don't want to be ordering like just a, a soda or a carbonated soft drinks, you know. Um, so what, you know, what this crisis is highlighting is for sure is the the importance of health. You know, we've all seen, you know, yeast and uh, Dow getting out of stock in the out of shelf in the in the, in the supermarkets, you know, people baking bread, you know, by themselves. Uh, there is an element on, you know, I saw a post on Facebook yesterday of a friend of mine posting, you know, I just paid this much money for this, you know, 800 grams of bread. And, you know, per kilo, the price is almost like meat. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, and, and, you know, it makes you, it starts to make you think on, you know, money and, you know, and not only money, it's like, what am I eating? You know, am I, am yeah, I buying absolutely. this bread or am I baking it myself? You know, so the same thing is, you know, the, the health issue will grow more and more. And especially, I mean, now if there is one thing is health, you know, it's about uh, buying antibacterial. You mentioned uh, the rush to buy toilet paper, uh, you know, at the beginning of this session. And, you know, like, so, so they will, it will keep on growing because you know people will be more and more health aware and environmental uh, aware you know there was a statistics that i read in the czech newspapers they interviewed uh, you know a sample of czech citizens and and 70 or 77 i can remember percent were saying that they fear more uh, drought uh, you know the lack of water than uh, covid-19 and it's like 70%, you know? So it makes you think, you know, like sometimes on the media, all we hear is, not sometimes, I mean, every day on the media, what we hear is you know, about COVID, but there's a lot of other issues that have not disappeared from the world yes. and they will keep on being present in our life. So I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important. Your, I think your last question was about, you know, what craft uh, producers. What brands can do, as NOLO do. brands can uh, do, or should be doing, or should not be doing. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, I think for sure, I mean, they, they need to get more and more, you know, present. I mean, it's for sure it's about distribution, you know, tailored distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've been thinking about is like, honestly don't have an answer yet is is about you know uh, you know distribution on uh, um, you know distribution channels you know we we spoke many times about you know not going too wide when you're launching a brand especially when it's a premium brand you know to go through a uh, you know a seeding phase but you know at the same time now the the distribution channels are kind of like shifting you know uh, you know, they're changing and they are, you know, you know, some things are happening. So for example, Nolo brands is that, are you present in, you know, supermarkets, online stores? Uh, you know, that would be my first question is, uh, are you available because, or are you, you know, because like, you know, they were seeding the, the, uh, mainly to the, to the on-trade and especially to the, you know, 
key opinion leading outlets. And now the key opinion light outlets are gone for now, so to say. So what is your presence? What, you know, how are you keeping up with the mental availability and, you know, share of throat on, uh, on, on that one. But at the same time, that could be a, there could be a backlash because then all of a sudden you have opened up, uh, you know, to, to, to off trade key accounts and, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen after you, yeah. <laughs> you give your soul to the key accounts. Uh, so, so drink with moderation, develop with moderation. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Exactly. So that's the, and, uh, and, 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 and as you said, uh, rightfully in the beginning, you know, you know, unlearn what you know uh, okay. in uh, in a way as well, because you know, like uh, some quick decisions done in urgency might be the wrong ones, uh, and that's what you know brands should be aware of and always remind themselves. Cool. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we will definitely uh, uh, talk to each other uh, uh, soon. Uh, we have so many other aspects about the future of the on-premise, especially on the brand building side to investigate. And uh, thank you for now, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Filiberto. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, looking forward to, uh, to talk more with you about, uh, about future trends. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.